data, not classes as in courses at rows or whatever. A class is a collection of data and the functions that operate on that data. That's not the most accurate definition. The class is a blueprint for an object that is a collection of data and the methods that act on it. That's a pretty close definition. So I'm going to rewrite that and say an object is a collection of data and the methods, functions, that act upon that data. You can get more technical if you want. And a class is a blueprint for the object. You want to build a house, you buy some blueprints, and you hire somebody to go and create your house. The house is the object. You could create a hundred houses from the same blueprint. Didn't I not have the PowerPoint already done? On? We've already used structures. Classes and structures look amazingly similar. So Barbara, you'll want to check the front page of the news when you get in, front page okay. of our D2L. So procedural programming focuses on the processes, the actions of the program. I'm going to get my data. I'm going to perform some transformations on my data. I'm going to display my data. I'm going to run some loops until the user wants to quit. Right? That's procedural programming. And you try to break your code up into functions, procedures. Some languages call them procedures. The majority of languages nowadays seem to call them functions if they're not part of a class. A function that is part of a class is known as a method. That seems to be the universal term for it anymore. And object-oriented programming is based on the data and the functions that operate on it. See, I just said that an object is a collection of data and the functions, although I think I use the word methods. If I go back and modify this, yeah, methods, functions. People use all sorts of different terms. Some people call these behaviors. If you want to want to get a weird textbook that talks about the behaviors instead of the word functions. And some people will say that instead of data, it is attributes or properties. And really, I don't think you need these fancy words. I think you can just say data and either methods or functions. I'd rather you use methods because that's a term that you'll see in Java and C, C++. So I'm going to delete the properties one and I'm going to delete the behaviors one. So they're saying it's a representation. Well, let's see exactly what this textbook says. The Java one has a different definition for it. Objects are instances of ADTs that represent the data and its functions. Well, we would have to know what an ADT is. Abstract data type. The abstract data type is the class. It's abstract until you create an object that matches it, right? Your blueprint is just theoretical until you build a house then that's not abstract, that's your real thing. When you create an object from a class, that's what it is. It's an instance of the ADT, of the abstract data type. So if you have a class named canine, then you could create some objects based on that, of that type. Like you could create objects, dog one, dogs two, the act of creating it's a real fancy word, instantiation. So each object is an instance. Each object is an instance of the class. Just like each house you build is an instance of the blueprint. 
Now, that's not the way we talk about blueprints, right? But that's the way programmers talk about their, their objects and their classes. So the limits of procedural programming. If the data structures change, the functions also have to be changed. If you decide that all your functions need to take flo um, floats rather than doubles, you may have to go and modify 30 functions in your code in order to accept floats rather than doubles. Programs that are based on complex function hierarchies, if there's functions here, there, and everywhere, supposedly difficult to understand and maintain, supposedly difficult to modify and extend, and easy to break. Now, the reason I'm putting the word supposedly in there is that if you've done procedural programming for 30 years, if you're a C programmer, a COBOL programmer, a procedural-based language, and then you come into a really heavily object-oriented language like C-sharp, it can blow your mind at first. You don't think it's easy to understand and maintain. You don't. But in general, object-oriented programming is a more solid foundation for programming. And everything you use in Windows is based on object-oriented programming. All the user interfaces are so that each menu is an object, each button is an object, each pull-down slider is an object, each scroll bar is an object, everything on the desktop is an object. When you click an icon, it launches an object. That's just the way that programming is done anymore. About the only exception to that is if you're a Linux user, the Linux kernel, the core underneath it all, is written in straight C because the guy who created it, Linus Torvalds, insists that C programming is more reliable and more memory efficient than C++. And he certainly has a point about the more memory efficient. So that's the one case where non-object oriented. But you can kind of simulate the concepts of object oriented programming even in a procedural language. You know, because the ideas of objects, of gatherings of data, and then functions acting on that existed before the languages that supported it existed. So, object-oriented programming terminology. A class is like a struct. We played with structs just a little bit. A struct is a grouping of related variables. You could make a person class and it would have their first name and their last name. You could make a book class and it have the author, you know, the publication date and the book title. But variables and functions in a class can have different properties than in a struct. I don't think that's true. That's a flat out lie. I'll tell you why in a minute. An object is an instance of a class in the same way that a variable is an instance of a struct. If you make a struct and then you create a variable from it, that struct, that variable is of that type. Now, the reason I said that's a lie is because in C++, the word struct and class are exactly synonymous. They can be used interchangeably. There's only one difference, which is that all of the members of a class are private by default, and all of the members of a structure are public by default. But you can change those. You can change those defaults just with a single word, in which case they behave exactly the same. You can even add methods to a struct in C++. But that's kind of weird. And for backwards compatibility, you shouldn't be doing things like that. You should just maintain a struct as being a simple collection of data. Something like this. Struct animal. And it's going to have a string that's a species. And it's going to have a string that's a name. Right. And then you can make an animal, and you can give those things some values. So animal a1, a1.species equals apatosaurus, brontosaurus. They finally brought the name brontosaurus back into usage. You know, that's like the most commonly loved dinosaur name besides Tyrannosaurus rex. And like, you know, in the 1960s, people decided that there weren't any things such as a brontosaurus, that they were all apatosaurus. They finally brought it back. A slightly different species. A1.name is equal to bronto. Right. Okay. Just like that. So one variable carries around multiple pieces of data. 
That's like a structure. I mean, that is a structure. So animal is an instance of the struct, of the animal struct, the animal structure. So a class is a blueprint, just like a blueprint of a house. And objects of the house is built from the blueprint. The attributes are the members of a class. And the methods or the behaviors are the member functions of a class. It's trying to uh, model real world stuff where, you know, I have some attributes. I have a name, I have hair color, I have a job, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And then I have things that I can do. You tell me to teach, I go and teach. You tell me to sleep, I go and sleep. And so those are the functions. I have a sleep function and a te teach function. And then I have some attributes. The members of the class are the variables and the functions that are attached to it. So if you say member variables, those are just the variables in it. These are member variables right here. And this thing doesn't have any functions in it because you're not supposed to put functions inside of a struct, although it's strictly legal. And I forgot that unlike Java, you do have to end these definitions in a semicolon. Now don't space out just because I'm not making y'all type this stuff along. So more on objects is the concept of data hiding. That's restricting access to certain members of the object. You can put the data behind the object in any sort of format you want and then you just tell the other programmer or yourself how to access it. So that data could be in any form. It could be something that gets saved to the file, it gets written out to the cloud or whatever, and then you give it the list of functions that the programmer uses to access and use that data. And then if you ever needed to change the way it's, it was saved or what, the way it was loaded or where it was stored, you could make those changes and it wouldn't even change the program necessarily because they're still just going to be using the interface that you provide. So the public interface are the members of the object that are available outside of the object. It's about time to crank up some code so we can play with this. Grab my boilerplate. What lecture are we on? Awesome. I've had few classes that wrap around from Z and have to go to A2 and B2 and C2. Well, we never get to C2, but we have wrapped around a couple of times. Not this time, we had a few absences. My fault. In school weather closings. All right, I'm going to create a source file. Lecture Y. Paste my boilerplate. And I'm going to define a structure, just like I did before. Struct animal. And one school of thought, and a very common one, is that all your structures in your classes should begin with a capital letter. C doesn't seem to follow that rule, which is why strings are lowercase s in C, whereas Java and C sharp do, which is why string is an uppercase thing in those languages. So I don't care. I'm going to leave it lowercase. And every animal, string, species, because they have a name, excuse me, they have a species, they have a name, that's about enough, about enough to prove the point. So we're going to create an animal, maybe two, maybe three. Animal A1. Animal A2, A1.name equals Mickey, because of course he's a mouse. A1.species equals mouse. A2.name equals Donald, because he is an aquatic waterfowl. A2.species equals duck. Now this is strange syntax, which I don't use, 
But as you're creating it, you can initialize it like this. A3, goofy, end quote, comma, dog. And I seem to be getting syntax error, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to delete this. Go away. Never mind. Pretend that didn't happen. Delete it quickly. We're going to make a mouse class now. It's going to be a class rather than a structure because we're going to attach methods to it. We're going to attach functions to it. And it's going to be, what are we going to do? We're going to track the mouse's name, its age, and its weight, and its growth factor, how quickly it grows. So the class definition looks a lot, oh, and by the way, these things are just variables. If you want to write somebody's name out, C out, error, arrow, A1 dot name, error, arrow, NDL, right? It's just a variable, just like any other kind of variable, because these variables are part of this object, just like the apples are part of the tree. The walls are part of the house. I never know if my examples make sense. All right. So let's make a class now. Class mouse. And I'm sorry, guys. No, I'm going to just go with, look. no, I'm going to try to teach all the industry standard things. And for lots of people, making class names that an uppercase letter is desired. So I made it a capital M. All right, every mouse is going to have a couple of attributes. It's going to have a name, string name. It's going to have an age, int age, and days equals zero. I'm going to go ahead and initialize it. And then a weight, like in grams. Why don't we make the weight a floating point value? Double weight equals zero. And strictly speaking, I don't have to be initializing things. Because things that are declared outside of functions or methods always are initialized to zero. But it makes me feel good to see zeros there. I'm going to add some comments that this is in days and that this is in grams. And then a growth rate. And since it's a fraction, double rate is equal to, let's default to 100%, so just 1. But we'll let the user change that. We'll let the programmer change that. All right. I'm feeling good. I know how to use these things. Mouse M1, comma M2. Let's make two mice. M1.name equals Ricky, Ricky the rat. And it gives me a syntax error. The reason why is all of these variables are private meaning they can only be accessed from within the class, not outside of it. You want that variable to be public? We can do that. We would put the public keyword in front of it. We get to pick which variables we want to be private or public, or we can set them all to be one or the other. Here's how you set them all at the same time, and this is different from Java if you've taken Java. You only have to set it once, public colon, and then all the variables after that. Really? Excuse me, I'm going to hit the PowerPoint. Don't get it. Oh, and it went away. All right, I love errors that do that. Whenever you see a weirdo error, just hit Control S to save, and maybe the error will go away. It did this time. So all of these are now public variables, meaning I can set their name and stuff like that, right? M1.name equals M1.age equals, you know. Maybe I don't want these. Maybe I want all of the mice to start off as babies. 
Maybe I don't want to let the program change the age. I might go and I might make that variable private. Don't think I'm going to do that yet. Although the book will say make all your variables private. And we could follow that paradigm. That's called encapsulation, where you keep the data safe from the program. The program doesn't get to change it. The program only gets to call functions which change it, which gives you a level of control over how that stuff gets changed. Right, if I did this, age is equal to negative, you know, 9,000, whatever. Um, that's probably going to break my statistics. I should not have allowed the programmer, including me, to do that or for reading data off the net or a scale is malfunctioning. So we can make a function up here called set age that does some data validation. It does not allow negative numbers or it does not allow, you know, numbers that are too large, unreasonably large for a mouse, a pound, right? That'd be a big mouse. So we're going to make these variables private. Although I hate to make name private, but I'm going to anyways, because that's considered good programming practice. Good programming practice is to make your variables public. And when, when I say good programming practice, it doesn't mean you can't be a great programmer and not do it. It's, it's a recommended thing, but on the other hand, Some people will find that if, or say that if you're just creating variables and giving them all getters and setters and you're not validating the data or anything like that, you should just let the program have access to them because it doesn't make it more secure from a security standpoint. All right, so good programming practice. Data, your variables are private and your methods are public. So what kind of methods? Well, see, now that I made them private, I can't access them anymore. And do you remember when I said that a class and a structure are technically the same thing, even though we shouldn't treat them? If we wanted the structure to behave exactly like the class, all we don't do this. All we would have to do is type the word private, and it would start being that way. Because the default is public for a class, excuse me, for a struct. On the other hand, the default for a mouse is private. So I didn't even need that word. I like seeing that word. It makes me feel good. It makes me know that everything underneath it is a private variable. And the Java folk are used to seeing it declared like this, private, and you put that word, on, don't type this, you put that word on each one. Instead, you just declare a section of private variables and you can declare a section of public variables. All right, maybe we'll make a function that initializes some of these things, like a set name function. So public space set name parentheses and it's going to take a string that's going to be a name string in and I forgot to give it a data type a return type and so that's why it's underlined public void because it doesn't return anything oh and here I go I'm using Java syntax public colon void set name. Now if you feel like it, you could put the type in front of every variable. I'm going to erase this, but you could do this. Private colon int like that. Private colon int like that. Right? You could do that and then it starts to look a lot more like Java. The C++ programmers look, look kind of cross-eyed at you if you do that. Alright, so we're going to set the name. We're going to use what's known as the this keyword this dot name equals n. Now strictly speaking, if I was doing this professionally, that's why we got an error here. Expression must have class type. I may get rid of that. Okay, that fixed it. Sorry guys, I slipped into Java. To reference the members of the class when you're inside that class, to reference the attributes, you don't use dot like you do in Java. You use the arrow. This hyphen greater than name equals n. 
And as I was just about to say, if I was writing this professional code, instead of doing in there, I would do name there. Now, I'm not going to even provide a setter for the age. They all start off at zero days, and that's just it. They don't change. I mean, the uh, program's not allowed to change them. Mouse is born, it's automatically born at zero days old. I guess there's no preemies. But we might want to set their weight, or might, we might just want to set a default value for their weight. Maybe we should have said that the uh, all mice start off with a weight of one. Yeah, let's, let's, let's let them change it though. So void space set weight parentheses and the data type of weight is a double. So double space weight and then curly brace this dash weight equals weight or this dash greater than weight equals weight. The weight for this particular object is equal to what's passed in as a parameter there. And lastly, the growth rate. We want to let the programmer set the growth rate. Some mice grow faster than others. So void set rate parentheses, and you're, you're starting to see the pattern. You can type this yourself. Double rate, close parentheses, this dash greater than rate equals rate. Strictly speaking, the this reference, the this pointer is not necessary if you give this a different variable name. Now don't make this change. But if I had left this as in, then I could have gotten away with doing that. If I made that in as well. However, if I like to have a good parameter name like that, well, this wouldn't make any sense. Name is equal to name. Well, that doesn't mean a darn thing. Of course, name equals name. You have to use this dash greater than to indicate that this name variable is a part of this class rather than referencing that parameter. So if you like using the name as a parameter, if you like giving your parameter variable a name that matches the attribute name, you're going to use this syntax. Then we should probably provide getters for all of these. A get weight and a get rate and a get age and a get name. I'm going to skip that for now. We'll go back and add them. Now nah, I'm not going to skip them. We're going to write them. Okay, so what is the data type of a name? We just scroll up a little bit and tell me how we declared name. As a string, okay. Now these need to be public because the calling code, the so-called client code, the main code, needs to be able to access it. So public colon string because it's going to return a string. Get name, and a lot of programmers would actually be capitalizing N and R here and W, and but since I didn't start off doing that, I'm not going to do that. Parentheses in parentheses. Now why didn't I pass in a parameter variable? Because we're not changing the data, we're just getting it. So we don't need to pass in a new value. And so then we're going to make that return get name, parentheses, in parentheses, semicolon. It's about time to stop typing and to test it to make sure we don't have syntax errors. If I was doing this for my own purposes, this is not exactly standard, but you would see it. I would put these all on one line. And what do I mean by that? Don't do this because I'm going to undo it. I would make it look like that. And then, I, you know, I would list them all like that. They're just getters and setters. They don't need to take up, you know, eight pages of space on your screen. But for now, I'm going to leave them like that. All righty, I spaced out. Please repeat the question. Oh, you're right. 
You're right. We don't need another public keyword down here. My mistake. We already have public set up here, and it's you know it stays the same until changed. So we can delete that one. Didn't break it, just unnecessary. Thank you for pointing that out. All right, so this is absolutely broken now. Why? Because name and age are private variables. But we have setters for them. We're going to give those setters fancy names. A setter is technically known as a mutator, just like mutant. Hulk. Hulk turned into a mutant when he was exposed to gamma rays. He changed. So the setters change things. And the getters are known as accessors. Getter is a, oh, why did I say mutant? Mutator, mutator. And getters are known as accessors. And I guess good English would be to say getter is an accessor, like that. Usually I word it as setters are mutators, getters are accessors. I don't know why I put it in the singular type. All right. We can't set their names like that. Instead, we have to do m1 dot set name. Whoopsie. Parentheses. And we're going to pass in the name. Ricky. Oops. I'm changing the mouse. I did not realize that we had made the, uh, the mouse... No? I'm all good. All right. Why am I getting an error there? Because I don't have an end quote. All right. So that's his name. His growth rate, he grows 5%, so 0 0.05. And we're going to set his weight. M1 dot set weight. He starts off at one gram. Maybe he starts off at two gram. He's a big baby. And we did not create a set age. All right. We only added one getter, get name. But we could get the data out with it, right? C out, arrow, arrow, m1 dot get name. Parentheses, in parentheses, arrow, arrow, EMDL. And why did we set it up like that? We can make the set name function do some checks. It might forbid empty names. It might forbid names with non-ASCII characters in it. It might forbid names with spaces in it, right? You know, it might forbid names that are more than 80 characters long. It can do some data validation. The idea behind what is known as data encapsulation which is setting everything private, all the variables private, and the members public, the functions public, is data validation. You want to keep your object in a state where the data is always good. And so the setters can validate the data as it's being changed. And if there's a problem with it, it doesn't have to change it. If they send in an Ill illegal name, then we don't have to do that, right? We can instead generate an error. We can cause this data, we can make sure that this data is always good by validating as we put it in. Set weight, for example, should not allow negative values. And we're not adding that, but we could. All right. We need a grow method. Every time we call the grow method, the mouse gets a day older and it gets a little bit heavier. So underneath get name, I'm going to add, I guess I could add my other getters while I'm thinking about it. Double get weight, parentheses in parentheses, return this dash greater than weight. double get age, except I think we declared age as an int. There's nothing wrong with returning it as a double. Int space get age. I'm going to use that shorter syntax now. 
open curly brace, return this dot age semicolon close curly brace and again I did this dot Java habit this hyphen greater than age and then int what else do we have besides name weight and age oh rate and it's not an int double get rate parentheses in parentheses curly brace return this arrow greater than weight. Now we're going to have to talk about pointers in a little bit to explain what that arrow syntax is. Alright, so now we have some getters. And as a matter of fact, I am going to modify my code in the way that I suggested just to make them all sit in one short amount of space. The book's certainly not going to show you that. But I don't think it's a bad thing to do. You see what I did? There's all my getters now. I'm going to even add a comment to that effect. Getters, parentheses, accessors. And we should have had several weeks about creating classes. I should have gone through some other material more quickly and then keep throwing classes in as we went along brushing up against it and going away from it. Some languages absolutely everything is a class Java and C sharp and so you hit with it from day one. Alrighty so we have our getters up here above our first set statement those are our setters so I'm going to go and add a comment to that effect up here. So underneath the public statement Void set name, these are setters, parentheses, mutators. Okay, our grow method. It's going to add one to the, de to the age and it's going to increase the weight by the percentage. So, does it need to return anything? I don't know. Is it going to return the new weight? Is it not going to return anything? Maybe the new weight. Nah, let's just make it void. It's going to be strictly a grow method and not return any data. Void grow. I was thinking about making it accept a certain number of days and then growing it by that many days, but instead you're going to have to grow it every day. So void, grow, each time you call it, age gets increased by one. Now I'm going to leave off the this reference, just to show that I can, age plus plus. It would not be wrong to put it there, but it's not strictly necessary because it would not be arguing with any, with any uh, parameter variable name. And as a matter of fact, Okay, I made a serious error here, and somebody who's done a um, like yeah, Java. You see that line right there, get name? This is a function that calls itself. It would enter an infinite loop, and then it would crash as it ran out of stack space. Change that return get name, and I'm sorry, that was one of my non-intentional mistakes, to just return this arrow greater than name. Semicolon. Don't know how I cooked that one up. All right, so weight has got to increase as well. Weight plus equals weight times the growth rate. I like using parentheses even when not necessary. Weight plus equals parentheses weight times rate. That's enough. And lastly, just to make it easy to get some information to display these mice, we're going to add a print or a display method to our object. So void display, parentheses in parentheses, curly brace. 
let's print out their name. See out arrow arrow quote name equals end quote arrow arrow name arrow arrow endl. See out arrow arrow quote maybe a couple of spaces to differentiate right or tab or something tab weight equals end quote arrow arrow weight arrow arrow endl see out arrow arrow quote backslash t age equals end quote arrow arrow age arrow arrow endl and see out arrow arrow quote backslash t rate equals end quote error error rate error error end deal All right, we're going to create some mice and we're going to grow them. Is everybody done typing this part? If not, I need to wait a little. I need to slow down. I would like to see your notes at some point. It may not even have to be now, but I'd like to see the notes that you were typing. The notepad notes? Yes. Sir. Okay, yeah, I'll bring those back up in a little bit. All right. All right, I'm going to scroll down to main. We've created a rat, a mouse. We've set his weight and we're going to grow him like five days. So m1.grow, parentheses in parentheses, m1.display, in parentheses in parentheses. In fact, we could write a for loop that would, you know, age him like 10 days. Let's do that. For parentheses int x equals 0, x less than 5 x plus plus curly brace m1 dot grow parentheses in parentheses m1 dot display parentheses in parentheses all right there he is there's our mouse, getting bigger each day. Day one, he weighs 2.1. Day two, he weighs 2.205, and so on. So how do we think about our mouse? We think of our mouse as an object. It's a thing. He's got some attributes. And besides being cute and furry and having ears and stuff, he's got a weight, and he's got an age, and he's got a growth rate, and a name. Although you're not supposed to name your lab rats, are you? You get really, you know, attached to the thing. So, and he's got some behavior, some methods that use that data. We've only made two. But we call grow, and he gets bigger. We call display, and we get to see a printout of his information. Now, wouldn't it be nice if we didn't have to create the object in this task? Right, we had to create it and then do three sets. It would be much nicer if we could set all that information as we create it. Like this. Here's how I want it to work. I never did use M2, so I'm going to delete M2. Taking the comma M2 out, I just changed that line. That'll probably come back to haunt me. I mean, somebody's going to miss that I did that. Mouse M2, parentheses, his name, Minnie, her name. Minnie, comma, who's got, she grows a little bit more slowly, 0 0.04, and she also starts off at 2 grams. I want to be able to do that. I want to make my mouse that easily. 
But that doesn't work. It needs a constructor. A constructor is a method that creates the mouse and fills in all the information with the parameters. I want to make sure I get the syntax exactly, exactly right, so I'm going to go ahead and go back to the PowerPoint. I did. All right. So what is a constructor? It's the member function that's automatically called when an object is created. Well, we didn't have a constructor, and yet it was created. Yeah, that's true. If you don't provide a constructor, there's a default constructor that gets created behind the scenes. We don't ever get to see it, but it's there. And all it does is it allocates the RAM for the object and initializes all the variables to zero if they're not already initialized. Its purpose is to construct an object. Its function name is its class name, and it has no return type. It doesn't return a void or an int or whatever. It's constructing the object. So we're going to scroll up to our mouse. And I like putting the constructor at the very top, underneath the variables. So right there under our word public, inside mouse, we're going to create our constructor. It ought to be public unless you have a real strong reason. Oh, wait, I don't need to do that. We've already declared it. Constructors should almost always be public, because otherwise you're not going to be able to make one down in main. It's got the same name as the class, mouse. And then it's got a parameter list. If we did that, it would be a default constructor because it didn't accept any parameters. But we want it to accept parameters. We want it to ex accept a name, string name. We want, it, we want to accept a weight. So double weight. We want it to accept a rate. So double rate. And I capitalized string, which is incorrect for this language. I'm sorry, guys. I just taught, taught Java for four hours straight. Here we go. Lowercase s string. And so again, this dot name, or I could call our set name functions. I think that's legal. Set name parentheses name. Set weight parentheses weight. I didn't have to do it this way. I could have done it the same way that the setters do it. This dot weight equals weight. This dot name equals name, and so on. And set rate, parentheses rate. But if I have those setters, I may as well use them. Now, this should make our constructor error go away, but I seem to still see a red dot down here. So I'm dubious as to what's going on there. Aha. Now what's the problem? Well, I added a constructor, and it's got all those parentheses and parameters, and so now I'm no longer allowed to make a mouse with this nice, easy little statement. Don't do this, because I'm going to undo it. But if I had to, I could, whoopsie, I could fix that by doing this. Where's my mouse? There we go. I could say, OK, he doesn't have a name. And he doesn't have a growth rate. And he doesn't have an age or a weight. And then, OK, yeah. That would fix it, but that's kind of stupid, right? That made it harder to create an object. So I need to go back, and I need to provide a default constructor. Once you add what's known as a parameterized constructor, a custom constructor like we did here, it removes the default constructor. And so that nice, clean syntax is gone. So we're going to make one. A default constructor is just one that has no parameter list. Mouse, parentheses, in parentheses, open curly brace, close curly brace. There, that's enough. That's enough for the default constructor. Now, it could do more than that, but that's really all it needs. You know, we could set the name to something like, you know, default name or, you know, mouse or something and we could set the rate you know but we already set these things up here I guess we never gave them a default name we could do that so I'm going to modify our string variable name equals to quote default just so just so that if we ever displayed the mouse we would know that it had not been initialized correctly and it's slightly better than seeing the word null which is what we would see otherwise 
Okay, that's our default constructor. Now that we've added the default constructor, and I'm going to go back to the notepad page now to add some notes. Now that we've added the default constructor, we have two ways of creating these objects. One is to do, okay, he says it's not right, but maybe if I control S, that error will go away. Yep, control S, fix that error. Now he's good to go. We can create a mouse like that, and we can set each attribute individually. Or we can create a mouse in this nice, fast, spiffy syntax. Totally up to you. You don't have to add a parameterized constructor. I think it's a good idea. It makes the object easier to use. The only drawback is, is that as you add more attributes to it, as you add more, per, um, more variables, then you probably need to go back and modify your constructor each time. And so then that breaks the code that was creating it um, anyways. I think a constructor like that can be very useful, but if you're going to be adding a lot of member variables over time to it, and which would require you to add a whole bunch of variables to your constructors, it might not be such a good idea because you'd require more programming changes. And one of the ideas of encapsulation is to make it so that you can make changes behind the scenes and it will not break your existing code unless absolutely necessary. All right. Since now let's copy this for loop, and I'm pretty sure that I've uh, gone too fast for some folks, and so we're going to uh, slow way down just a minute. I want this for loop to grow many as well. So this loop does that. And there we go. We get to see our output. Ricky, I'll be right back there. Ricky grew five days and wound up at a maximum weight of 2.55 grams. Minnie grew five days, and I guess she's a faster grower. I thought I made her a slower grower, yeah, and she. Weight and, uh, rate on that Which question? 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 Which So 0.04 and 2, but on my constructor, I said that the second parameter was the weight and the third one was the Okay. So if you don't want many to be growing like a really growy thing, <laughs> then uh, change the order of these parameters. Many starts off at 2 grams and has a growth rate of 0.02 or whatever we said she was going to be, 0.04. Oh, that problem I mentioned about if you add new parameters, um, new variables, you always have to change the constructor is not strictly true because you can add default values to the constructor. And this will be the last thing i show you and then I'll do some wandering about. I'll show you what I mean. If I added some new variable, like color, the mouse has a color, I could come up here and do string color, and I'm going to probably undo this. And then back here, after all my variables, I could provide another parameter, right, string color, but I could give it a default value. By default, all mice are white. And then I would not have to modify my constructor because I have a default value for that variable. And then if I feel like being more specific, I could. I'm going to undo those changes now and try to get things working for folks. All right, rather than leave this on the screen, I'm going to bring the notes back because some people need it, but I'm going to wander around and help you all finish typing if you need help. Am I going to need to scroll up? You need to see the stuff yes, higher please. than that. That's just about all the way up. Yep, that's up. Okay. If you if you had need, whoops, I need to remove that change. Guys at home, don't type those things. All right. If you had a function that needed to return an object, say I wanted a function called a make mouse. 
you just use that class type as its return type. Mouse, make underscore mouse, and it accepts a name, but it doesn't do anything else, right? So then you can do mouse m parentheses, we could pass in the name and we can give some other default values for whatever purpose, although those are pretty bad default values. And so instead of that, I'm just going to make mouse m and I'm going to do m.setName and leave the other ones as they were, like that. And then return m. Now what that does is it does something called returning on the stack. And it may not be the best way of handling this. But if we want to use that function, and we do mouse m3 equals make underscore mouse parentheses, and this is Fred the mouse, like that. This could be a method inside the class. If you do that, it's called a factory method. And uh, some programmers recommend creating a factory method. Now, to me, the, con the constructor is a factory method. And if I had designed the language, I would have made the constructor have to return an object of that type. I would have had you do this. Well, I guess that's kind of superfluous, though. Mouse, mouse. But that's how I would have done it. And I would have put a return keyword there that said return the mouse. Anyways, no, you don't have to do that. If you're going to make a constructor, though, excuse me, a factory method, you have to do, you have to, and this isn't going to make sense to folks who we haven't talked, who haven't taken Java or something, you have to create it as a static method. What's a static method? Well, we're getting ahead of ourselves. But I'm going to go ahead and give an example. Static mouse make. And maybe it takes a name, and maybe it takes an age, no, a weight, double weight, and maybe it takes a growth rate, lowercase s, and then all it has to do is make a mouse of that type, mouse m, passing in those things, name, weight, rate, and the syntax is going to be looking a little bit, this is a little bit beyond, but you're asking the kinds of questions that make me know that some of y'all are keeping up. Now, if we want to call that function, since this is declared a static, a static method does not require you to have an instance of the class in order to do it. Well, that totally sounds like gobbledygook, but if I come down here, and I want to use that factory method, I would do this. Mouse M4 equals, and then I would use a capital mouse dot. Or is it arrow? Why am I getting why am I getting grief from it? Mouse dot make Sam comma one comma one. Doesn't seem to be doing it. What did I declare wrong? Well then, this seems to be right. That seems to be wrong. I'm not going to mess with fixing it <laughs> at this time. Hmm. Oh well. Delete that M4. Didn't work. I don't care if you had added that factory method or not because we didn't get it to work. It's about time to wrap it up, but I want to hit the ideas of pointers one more time, or maybe it was the first time, that's horrible if that's the case, so that we can hit it again on our next lecture. A pointer, when we pass, and I've said this before, this language is a pass by value, a pass by copy, meaning that when you pass something into a function, it passes a copy of the data. A pointer contains a memory address. 
And if I give you a copy of my house and you wreck my house, you haven't wrecked my house, right? You just wrecked a copy of it. It sounds ludicrous almost. But if I give you the address to my house, you can go and wreck my house. That address is a pointer. If we have a function that takes a pointer, it actually does change the type. So we're going to make a method called show that accepts a pointer to a mouse. So void show parentheses mouse star p mouse. I swear that's the name of a character in a book that's nagging at me. All right. And then we can call p mouse arrow greater than display. Well, then why didn't we just call mouse display? I don't know. But it's just a demonstrate. This is how you reference the members of an object if you have a pointer rather than the object itself. Now, why would you do that? Because you can change the values of it. You want to change his age? We could do that. P mouse dot. Well, you could anyways. Uh, I'm going to make one more sample function and then we are really done. Void change me. And it's going to take a pointer to an int. So int star pi. I meaning, no, that, that's a bad variable name, isn't it? Um, value, p value. And then so p value. No, 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 don't do that. Star p value is equal to 10. Now, why'd we do that? So that down here, when we create an int, like int x, now we, we're using x as counters, int z, we can call change me, and we can pass this in as an address. Just like I said, I could give you my address, and you can go and change my home. So this syntax allows us to not pass a copy of the object in, but to pass the address of the object in. And using the address you, by this syntax, this says go to the, at that address, drive over to my house, and change the data. If we had not done it that way, change me would not be able to change Z. And we've already given demonstrations of that. We'll talk more about pointers next time. I just want you to have tucked away in your brain that a pointer is a memory address. This is much more efficient, by the way. Maybe not just for ints, but if you have a large object, that object has to be copied into it, bit byte by byte. But if you can just pass in the memory address, that's just like an, you know, an eight byte little pointer, right? And then you're not passing in, you know, perhaps, you know, two, three kilobytes worth of object into it just to, just to pass it to a function. So passing by pointer is more efficient than just passing the object itself. But that's not strictly true if your if you're, uh, data types are simple things like this. Speed doesn't change. So our notes. Almost ran out of time. I mean, we did run out of time to talk about constructors and add notes and stuff like that. So I need to make a note to myself to rehash that on the next period. Rehash constructors, default constructors, talk a lot of, more about pointers. And we're going to talk about destructors, memory allocation, and memory free. So we have some topics to talk about. You see why we're I'm throwing in one last lecture. All right, let's stop.